Mr. Edsel Ford inaugurated the building of Europe's greatest motor car factory at Dagenham. And in addition, it meant work for thousands. No wonder they cheered. This riverside land was marshy. A bed of concrete was needed. So great piles were driven in, thousands of them in places so closely that the foundations became almost solid concrete, 80 feet thick. Steel, thousands of tons of the best Britain produced were delivered, and within a year, great workshops had grown. Roof trusses were lifted in complete sections, and from below, the thousand foot long roof frame appeared like a great steel web. Work at Dagenham was proceeding swiftly. Roofs were completed. The workshop floors were being prepared for the thousands of machines that modern car production demands. It was planned to manufacture from raw material, and a huge store yard for iron ore and coal was laid. And above this, the blast furnace was already rearing its great head. Not only did concrete form the store yard and factory foundations, but at the water's edge as well and caissons were sunk for excavating the river bed, ready for the concrete on which to build the 600 yards jetty. By this time, Dagenham was ready to receive machinery, and every day brought train loads of cases. Equipping the factory was as gigantic a task as building it. There were thousands of machines, each having its allotted space and task. So smoothly and swiftly was the installation made that September 1931 saw the first vehicle being driven off the conveyor by Mr. A. R. Smith, the general manager. The two and a half years since the inauguration ceremony had worked wonders. The jetty was rapidly taking shape, and one of the huge unloaders, destined to unload iron ore, limestone and coal for the blast furnace, was nearing completion. From the top of the unloader, the vastness of this great enterprise was apparent. To think that less than three years before, it had been marshland. Inside the works, machinery had been tested and was now manufacturing passenger and commercial vehicles in increasing number. Dagenham was in production. Thousands were in employment. October 1931, from out of the river mist, appeared the first ship to come alongside the jetty. It brought raw material for which the great store yard had been built. The following day, unloading began, and one more chapter in the story of Dagenham was opened. The jetty can take vessels up to 12,000 tons, and at its eastern end continues round to the store yard. A great deal, of course, still remained to be done before Dagenham could ultimately become self-contained. Five years had passed since the introduction of the new Ford. Years of continued progress, with vehicles still pitting their strength against hills, bends and rough surfaces. In the long procession of Fords, surely none had created a greater sensation than that eight horsepower car which was unveiled at the Royal Albert Hall in March 1932. It was immediately recognised as setting a new standard in popular motoring. Big car characteristics at small car price was the aim. The car's excellent appearance and superb performance placed it in a class by itself.
Dagenham had then been producing for a year, and this shot of one bay gives some indication of its size. By this time, too, the demand for populars kept that section at full speed, but before long, Dagenham was going to be busier than ever. On July the 13th, Dagenham received its most distinguished visitor. Such royal interest was surely indicative of the interest which Dagenham had aroused throughout the whole country. saw a fine new launch at Westminster. It was the new Dagenham, designed to take visitors to the works, not only to enjoy the trip, but to see Dagenham from the river, to view this wonder factory in industrial magnificence. There's the great powerhouse, which could supply electricity to towns bigger than Brighton or Blackpool. In addition to river trips, organized air visits were started. It's not a long journey to Dagenham by plane, but fine though the view is from the river, only from the air can the size of the forest be fully appreciated. the assembly lines were working at full pressure and in September 1936 the V8 line was producing the new 16 pounds 10 tax model. There it is, a fitting climax to the achievements of 1936. the enemy bombers, the vast Dagenham plant seemed a sitting target. Many anxious hours were spent in watching the skies. But although 200 bombs fell in the factory area, the furnace fires were never drawn and production never seriously held up. In the shops, the company, breaking with tradition, replaced many of their called up workers with women. And their devotion to their strange tasks amply justified the decision. The armies in the field owed much to the efforts of the men and women of Dagenham. Every Bren gun carrier, every light vehicle running on tracks, in every theater of war, had felt the touch of their workmanship. For all such machines had either been built by Ford or were powered by Ford engines from Dagenham. At the army testing grounds at Aldershot, Ford six-wheel lorries underwent special tests. These assessed their ability to operate under active service conditions. With their fine springing and chassis construction, they overcame all obstacles. Ford engines for war, driving Bren carriers, fire pumps, landing craft at Sicily, Italy and Normandy. Ford engines carried the Allies into Germany itself. It was V8 for victory. The Mayor's Show of 1947 featured this battle for food. The steel commando, the Forts and Major tractor and its many implements, was on view to thousands. During the war, Ford had delivered to British farmers 94% of all their wheeled tractors. Now the land called for all that Ford could give. 
by this time, Dagenham had seen the millionth vehicle off the production line. But the closing of one chapter marked, too, the opening of another. For today, Ford is fighting in a second battle, the Battle of Exports. From Dagenham's jetties go cars, lorries and farming equipment to over a hundred countries of the world. Cars, lorries and tractors earning precious dollars for Britain. For since the war, Ford had become the largest producers and exporters in the British motor industry. And the home market? Let us hope that it will not be long before more and better cars are on the roads of Britain, bringing the countryside within the reach of all. When that day comes, the name of Ford will still be as much to the fore as it has always been in the history of motoring. For the cavalcade of Ford is not over. It will go on as long as people like to own and drive motor cars. Motor cars like the Anglia, the Prefect and the Pilot. At Ford of Dagenham, all plans for car production were recast in 1948 and a new criterion of the road was set, five-star motoring. The first results, the Consul and the Zephyr 6, present you with an overwhelming fact. Within a few years of their introduction, one of every three new cars in the United Kingdom was a Ford, while at the same time exports increased. The Consul was awarded the Tulip Rally in 1952 against the pick of international competition. And a year later, the grueling Monte Carlo rally was won by the Zephyr 6. World approval of these cars encouraged Ford to bring their advantages to light car motoring. A woman generally has the last word. I don't know about that, but I know why we picked the Anglia. There simply matches a room. All the three children can get in the back without squashing up. Another reason is the size of the boot. We're the sort of family who never seem to be able to go anywhere without taking half the house with us. And I must say, we both appreciate what Ford call headroom. I hate having to crawl into a car. And another winner with us is the wide parcel tray. But of course, it wasn't only size we went for adjustable seats for long legs, driving pedals that cut out draught, and big curved windows at the front and the back we can all look out of. as they leave the foundry may look rough and crude to an untrained eye, but they are a precise engineering job. They have to be, because when they leave the foundry, they're going to be worked on by many hundred drills and cutters, all of them preset and automated. and our first operation is milling. Then we machine like uh, oil pump pads, fuel pump pads, which should be held to within 10 thou. We start drilling bolt holes, tappy bores, it's got to be within 2 thou. And then we come on to fine boring on the cylinder bores, which has got to be held within 1 thou. 
checking the gauge against the power and against the blueprint. We have a minimum amount of gauges on there of about 123. So you can just imagine on that one shaft alone, we have 123 checks. Why this emphasis on accuracy? because that is what the famous Ford service is based on. We can ship any one of our Ford parts to a Ford car anywhere in the world and know that it'll fit when it gets there. In the old days, perhaps, you could rely on skilled craftsmen, but today, the modern car industry relies on machinery more accurate than any man could ever hope to be. One of the most amazing modern developments in automation is the process of balancing every single crankshaft for optimum performance before it is fitted into the engine. inspection can be carried out by machines. For example, each set of gears is checked for smoother, silent running. Any wrong note and the teeth are trimmed and tested, trimmed and retested until the operator is satisfied. <laughs> 